have Tara come up and then also Shane will be following her in just a moment. Um, I'd like to turn your attention to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I know you just sat down, but could we stand one more time for the reading of the word of the Lord? Look, you, you've got up and down more times watching a Saints football game than that right there. So you're going to be okay, right? <laughs> I can't even hardly sit down watching the Saints back in the day. We'll see what happens this year. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. This is Paul writing. And could you read this with me this morning? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I want to just share a little bit this morning just for a few moments and then I'll be followed by these others today sharing parts of their story and testimony. You may be seated this morning. There is, there is something happening in American Christendom right now that the pattern, the pattern of church growth and methods are being challenged. I love going to conferences and getting ideas about church growth, but also God has given us this other book that talks a little bit about church growth. And in that, not only does it describe for us a life that is born again, where all things are passed away and behold all things become new but also there is this thing called discipleship and there is this thing called serving the Lord where, where people from their conversion step into their purpose and they begin to find their voice and somebody say it is a process it is a process one translation of the scripture that I just read, the New Living Translation, says, it is the power of God at work. This gospel is the power of God at work. At work where? At work in me. And so sometimes we have this ideal that coming to Christ and and surrendering to him that when we wake up in the morning, the birds are going to be chirping and the flowers will be blooming and somebody already has the coffee pot on for us and we wake up to the aroma of community in the house. Come on, say amen if you don't like that. Hallelujah. And it's like, and we walk out of our door and all of our neighbors are waving at us and we get into our vehicle and we drive to work and we get the promotion. We get the corner office. And, and God just really just blesses us. Yes, God does bless, but sometimes God is at work. And it's a process in our lives. And I think the reason many people face the giant of discouragement is because they were not prepared for the process. I thought you told me all things are going to become new. I thought you told me this was going to be easy. I thought you told me that God is going to work it all out. Yes, God is going to work it all out. But God, while God is working it all out, He is also working in you. One time when I was frustrated in the ministry and I was pastoring a church at a young age and it was growing and it was growing faster than what I knew how to handle. It was just things were getting crazy. I was getting so frustrated at times and, and we reached this peak and, 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 and this uh, presbyter at this time who was speaking to our lives, I think in conversation, picked up on some things that they had lived through and this individual told me, said, remember this, Pastor Lane? Remember what? That God's more interested in growing you than he is your church. And I'm like, what? No. Well, because it's this growing thing. This construction. It's the road sign saying construction ahead. It's the inconvenience of, where is my other lane I used to run in? I don't like having to merge. I don't even have the right of way here. Oh, I'm in the wrong lane. Who are those?
those people trying to turn in my past. And we get so frustrated, but we have to remember that God is at work. When we first moved here, that was a two-lane road out there. Bear High School Road was a little two-lane, country-looking road with too much traffic. Then I saw the little survey signs begin to pop up, and I thought, they must going to be doing, I'm pretty smart sometimes. They're going to do something. The road crew showed up, and they began to dig down. And I thought, they're making a riverbed. I told my wife, I said, you better remember this right now. Like this is some profound statement, because you will, you will forget how high the old highway used to be. Y'all remember seeing the cars that would run off the road and would be upside down in the construction zone? Do y'all remember the edges of the road where there was no shoulder? It was the K, and all they would do would just set an orange cone right there. Good luck with that. But now when I drive down there, it's like there's four lanes. And it's hard for me to remember what those two lanes was like. But I'm reminded when I'm driving on South Collie Saloon Road right there with all the construction, and I'm remembering that it's all a process for the good. And that this gospel is at work on the inside of me. Even in times of frustration, even in times when I feel like I have failed, even in times when I feel like, God, I don't even know, it's just chaos. God says, just lean into me and trust me because I am working in your life. It is the power of God at work in you. And so that I surrender to and say, God, just keep working. God, don't leave me like you found me. God, don't leave me like I was last week, last month, or last year. But God, change me, transform me to where I no longer represent and look like myself. But God, now I am representing and looking more and more like you every day so that when people see me or hear me or witness me, they are reminded a lot about you, God, that your glory and your power and your image is shining through God my life, that it is the gospel at work in me, even when it feels like a construction zone. And there's something powerful. I, I like that. God's power is at work. When is the last time that you've celebrated something that God is doing in you? When is the last time that you've celebrated and shared with what God has done for you? And I thought about this, and the Lord checked my spirit. And he says, do we as a church celebrate more about what we do for God that we forget to share what God's done for us? So much so that this week I've done this, and this week I've done that, and this week I've been busy, and this week is this and this and this and this and this. And it's like, all that's great, but people are not going to be impressed by your works, but people are waiting to hear your story and what God has done for you and what God has done for me. So there is something powerful about speaking your story, even when you don't even know the rest of the story like Paul Harvey, but you just know that God is doing something in your life and you share that with the right heart, not in self-righteousness, not on the job site saying gather around and let me tell thee what God has done through me. But it's your coworker that's going through it and you just reach over and grab their hand and say, can I pray for you right now? Or it's a text after work and it's a, hey, you shared this at work, but I just want to let you know what God's done for me. I, I just want you to know that God's not forgotten you. That, that you haven't slipped off his radar, that you're not lost in the peripheral, but God still has purpose and he has placed you right in the middle of where God wants you. Be patient through the process because God is still working. And when we begin to share our story, something begins to happen when we begin to hear ourselves speak what God has done for us. It builds faith. It reminds us of God's goodness in our life. And Revelations 12 and 11 says, and they overcame him, speaking about the wicked one, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Oh, when I begin to speak about what God has done and share 
what God has done. It changes my perspective. It, it allows me to see things a little differently. It, it allows me to confront the enemy that is coming against me to suppress me. And I'm reminded of Joel chapter 3 and verse 9. And, and this was a word proclaimed to the Gentiles. That's you and me. And he says this, proclaim this among the Gentiles. Let all the men of war, catch that. Let all the men of war do what? Let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. Verse 10 says, let them beat the plowshares into swords and pruning hooks in the spears and let the weak say, I am strong. I don't know if you called that when I first started reading that. He's saying, let the men of war come up, but he's really talking to farmers. Let the mighty men of war come up but they're hiding in the fields. They've got their head down. They're behind the plow. They just want to get the task done and go home. They've got questions. They're worried about the oppression. They don't know what to do with the enemy, but God is speaking to the prophets saying, tell the Gentile, tell those mighty men of God to come up and bring those plowshares with them. We're going to beat them into swords and pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say that I am strong. And when I begin to declare that over my my life devil I'll not engage these thoughts anymore I am the head and not the tail I am blessed and not cursed I'm called by his name I'm filled with his spirit I'm standing on his promises and I'm about to change this plowshare into a sword and go to battle and I'll say let the weak say that I am strong Hallelujah. when our life becomes a platform for his purpose when our life becomes a platform for his purpose. When we turn around and we survey where God has brought us from and what God has done to us and what God has done through us and we're amazed that, that we ever made it this far. How did God do this? The Romans lets us know that what shall we say then to these things. Sometimes you got to speak to the things in life. What shall we say to these things? What things? The things that try to hold you hostage. The things that try to keep you bound. The things that try to keep you tied to your past so you cannot go free in your future. Christ paid the penalty for our sins on Calvary, but we have to learn how to change the habits of the old sinful lifestyle. Can somebody say amen? And we have to declare to these things, whether it's the hurts, the habits, or the hangups, whether it's the voice of the past or fear of your future, we have to declare to these things. What do we declare? That if God be for us, if God be for us, who can be against us? Hey, there is some comfort in that scripture right now in the house for somebody this morning. As you begin to realize that God is not against me, that God is working, that yes, sometimes it is a construction site and sometimes it is a mess, but I'm going to trust God on this journey. Get up when I fall and if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Come on, clap your hands and give the Lord praise this morning. where he brought you from. You ought to thank God for the pain that you've had to go through. You ought to thank God for the trials you've been through. You ought to thank God when people didn't speak about you and it was unjust and it was wrong. When they thank God you survived that and you're standing on the other side. Hey, let man be lamb, but let God be God. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Amen. Come on, Tara, and share with what's on your heart this morning.
Good morning. I do announcements, but um, I've never told my story up here, so I need God's grace to get me through it. Um, and, that, and who all can testify that when you're asked to do something for God, that the attacks are going to come? It's been a rough week at work. My character was attacked. And so that's how I know I'm supposed to be up here telling this story. I was a happy child living in a small town called Platkham in Louisiana. I was the firstborn of my parents and the first grandchild on my dad's side. I was the apple of everyone's eye until my sister and other cousins came along. Everyone mattered, everyone was loved, everyone was cherished, and everyone was safe in that family. We had Sunday dinner every week at my Sicilian grandmother's house and her meatball and spaghettis were the best. We vacationed together and basically did everything together. I attended a small Catholic school. I was in dance and Brownies Club. If anybody knows what that is, it's a division of Girl Scouts. I had a normal, simple life. That all came crashing down when I was seven years old and I became the product of a broken home. Everything that I had held near and dear to my heart was ripped away. We moved to Baton Rouge with my mother and saw my father every other weekend. I'll never forget that year. After being taken out of our school in Blackman from where I had been since kindergarten, I was enrolled in a new and bigger Catholic school in Baton Rouge. My sister and I were so traumatized from what had happened, we only made it there three days. After crying and making ourselves physically sick with not being able to handle the transition, we moved back to Plaquemine and lived the remainder of that year with my grandmother. We were re-enrolled in a smaller school in an adjacent town called White Castle. It had that, same, that small town feel. It was one of those little towns where you stop at the pharmacy after school and Grandma buys you a slushy. Slushy puppy, I think, is what they used to call it or something like that. So if you did the math while I was speaking, we went to three schools in just one year that year. The years that followed were very tumultuous. Moving on average of once a year, having attended a total of seven schools between second and 12th grade. I became an expert on packing. We can move from one place into another in one day. And before we went to bed that night, we were fully unpacked, beds made, pictures hung. That's how my mom rolled. Only to do it all over again. It was difficult to put down roots at any given place before moving on to the next school. Always the new kid on the block, never quite fitting in. I literally have no childhood friends. And some may say, you tell your children when they're in school, oh, don't worry, these relationships don't matter. You're gonna grow up, you're gonna get married, you're gonna go to college. But it was difficult for me. Looking for affirmation as I became a teenager in all the wrong places. I got pregnant my senior year in high school. I was 17 years old. I left home to start a new life and do what I wanted to do for once. I had my beautiful daughter, Brittany, four months shy of my 18th birthday. I did graduate in May of that year. I had big plans to become a nurse, but I had a child that I was responsible for. So I found a job in, a, in the finance world. <clears throat> Life continued, I had a miscarriage, and then two years later, God blessed me with my son, Lucas. Most of that 10 years is a blur, continuing on a path that only led to more insecurity. At 27 years old, I met my soulmate, Alan. But a lot of damage had been done. 
the years of trauma, instability, and insecurities would lead me to depression and anxiety that would later manifest itself. As we blended our family and faced a lot of adversity, I began to battle depression and anxiety around the age of 35 years old. I was diagnosed with clinical depression, meaning it was a chemical imbalance and not situational. I was told that I would likely always suffer from this sickness. All the while, I never thought my childhood affected my mental health. I mean, that was 45 years ago. I had forgiven those who put me in that situation as an innocent child. I would always say I was sad about my childhood, but I never really thought it affected me. I would soon learn just how deep those wounds actually were. Eight months ago, I began to experience one of the darkest times in my life. My daughter-in-law, the mother of three of my beautiful grandchildren, and one of my best friends, decided she no longer wanted to be married to my son. And she turned her back on me also. It brought back all of those painful childhood memories. And now my son and grandchildren were experiencing those same things that I was forced to endure as a child. It was like reliving it all over again. Next to my parents' divorce, the closest pain that I had ever endured was the death of my father. The only difference is that he had no choice but to leave this earth when God called him home. My daughter-in-law had a choice, and she chose to walk away. I begged God not to let bitterness and unforgiveness set in. The pain was so deep, almost unbearable, and still is at times. I literally slept with my Bible and prayer cloth that Alan prayed over for me for four solid months. At times, my thoughts were too much to bear. I would place my Bible on my forehead to combat the thoughts of the enemy while crying out to Jesus. I told my husband to remove anything from my reach that I could use to cause harm to myself. Many of you prayed for me. I won't call names, but one individual approached me after church one Sunday to let me know that God had placed it on her heart to pray for me and against my depression. That meant the world to me. Others messaged and sent encouraging text messages at the most perfect moments. As I began to open up to others about my experiences and mental health issues, the healing process began to take place. In turn, I believe that I've been able to encourage others who are dealing with the same issues to not be afraid to speak up about their mental health. Thankfully, and all glory to God, I started to feel the depression lifting the week leading up to Easter. I'm here to tell you the only reason I'm here today, standing in front of you, is by the grace of God, his love for me, what he did on the cross for me and for you. It is literally what saved my life during this time. He conquered depression, anxiety, darkness, and so much more. I'm forever grateful and in awe of him. Little by little, he is exchanging my grief for his grace. Come on, give God some praise this morning. Come on, just thank the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Isn't it powerful when we hear somebody else's story? And Tara, thank you so much for sharing that. I know there's personal things that you shared that probably you've not shared with a lot, a lot of people in that. And when we hear that, we don't feel alone because we face something similar as well. But also there's hope, right? There's hope because of the price that he paid for us. And that if God can do it for somebody, God can also do it for me. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Tara. I remember, um, golly, it was about three years ago, and I was about to walk up on the platform and do announcements, and uh, I leaned over to Tara, and I says, Tara, you want to do announcements this morning? I knew what her response was going to be, because this was just like cold turkey, just right before announcement time. And she said, I saw the look in her eye like, you know, 
And I, I was like, ah, I'm just joking. And she tapped me on the shoulder and she says, what are they? I'm like, what are, what is, what, what's the announcement? So I handed her the piece of paper and she took the mic and she walked up here into the announcements. That's not how we usually plan and prepare around here. Right? And, and I looked at Alan's face was like, who is that giving an announcement? <laughs> and to watch her grow in God. And there is ministry in her. Can I tell you this this morning? Ministry is not about this platform. And ministry is not about this microphone. But her story has touched so many others that we don't even know who they are. But they know who they are. Because she's taken time for what God has given her in the share with others, to share that hope with others as well. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Come on, Shane, come on up. And uh, Shane's going to share a bit of a story. And after he gets through, we'll have the worship team come back up. And I believe God's got some good things in store for us today. Amen. Thank you, Shane. Well, I just want to thank you, Tara, because that was very courageous. And uh, I also, I can relate to the uh, attacks. This week, I had a horrible week of some things that happened on Easter, and they led up to every day waking up and going to bed, thinking about the same thing, and doubting who I was, and just exactly what she said. It kind of gets you distracted of where you're at and who you are in Christ. Um, but today, I just want to share, and I have not shared my whole story with anybody, so this is a big leap of faith. So. Um, I'll start off at 12 years old because I believe um, working with the youth uh, at 12 years old, I see them at myself at 12 years old, and I share with them that I just want to let y'all know that um, at 12 is when I started using drugs and drinking, trying to find who I really was in this world, and my identity was far from God. I, religion, we would go to church every Sunday, but I didn't. I didn't believe in God and I, I kind of rebelled against him because I thought he was a God that just wanted to just beat me up, beat me over the head. And uh, so at 12 years old, I started smoking marijuana at a very young age and um, up to about 16, I started meeting other people that would, you know, I can relate into drugs and I started selling drugs and um, I can remember Throughout the years from you know, 12 to 18, it would just always get stronger and stronger because I was trying to fill that void in my heart that God can only fill. And um, I've always felt like I never fit in, but today I know why, because I wasn't supposed to fit in with those people. And, and as as I turned 18, I started getting, you know, more and more rebellion, started driving, started going to parties, clubs, you know, you, you name it, it's all over. Every, every corner has a bar. So I go and um, I was reminded that even before that, God was calling me, even at high school. I, I didn't go to a Catholic or a Christian school, but I can remember a time on the way out, they handed me a Bible on the truck at the door out. And I was so far from God that I literally ripped a page out of it. And I've never shared this out before, but I ripped it out and I actually smoked some drugs in it. And uh, looking back, you know, it's just, I was so rebellious against and hated God that I, I cherished those holy scriptures today. And I, I, it hurted my heart and I worked through that, but it's just looking at myself from now, a 34 year old man to 16, it's like, man, you were really jacked up to do that. And my cousin that was with me looked at me, he's like, are you seriously doing that? That is a holy Bible. And I, you know, looking back today, it's like, man, you were just so rebellious. So um, 18 to 23, it just kept getting worse and kept getting worse. And the drugs kept getting stronger. I was at the point of just uh, taking handfuls and taking handfuls just to feed uh, who I was trying to be, I just kept feeding. So uh, 22, I had uh, Anne-Marie, which y'all all know Anne-Marie is uh, my daughter. And I actually could not be a father to her. So uh, 23, her mom left me. Um, I was all alone. The last year, I started going to doctors, started filling that thing, get prescription drugs and keep feeding it. But 24, I was up probably about three or four days on drugs and 
I can hear a voice on the inside of me that kept telling me, you need to get help. You need to get help. You need to get help. So I went. I went to a detox hospital, and that's where I really had a crossroads. So I went in. By the third or fourth day, it was so cold in this place, in this hospital from detox, that um, the hottest place of the hospital would be the bathroom. I would turn on the showers because it would steam up. And I can remember we had, we had AA meetings every day in this hospital just to find a purpose. And, and they started talking about a spiritual journey in God, the person that I hated the most. And I can remember that everything was stripped away from me, my daughter, my family, and even myself. Like I was just out of control. But I can remember by the third or fourth day, I couldn't even talk because the drugs that were out, coming out of my body, I was stuttering. I couldn't even make a sentence. So I went in the bathroom, I turned <clears throat> the water on, steamed it up, but I can feel in my side that I needed to just kneel down. And when I kneeled down, I cried out God for the first time that I didn't even know. And he literally just touched my heart and touched my body. And I just, I was never the same until that moment in my life. And I knew it was him because I seen some things a couple days later in the dark. And um, I never shared it with anybody. It's just, that was the tipping point of actually just getting on my knees and begging for my life because I didn't, it, that was it. I was, I was, if I was gonna get out of the hospital, if I wouldn't have changed, I would have died. And my parents confirmed that because it was only a week or two out, they were gonna bury me. So um, when I got out of there, I, I started going to our saviors down the road at 24 because I had something on the inside of me kind of switched. So I started kind of listening to others and just, I sat for the first five years and I didn't do anything but just sit and just listen and just learn the word of God. I just learned, I just soaked it in and I started applying this to my life. And I remember going through freedom and freedom, this, this person that was leading me through freedom group, he said, you have to take that. And there was one scripture that really changed my whole life it was uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And he said, you have to read that over your life every day. And I put it everywhere in my house, my, my eyes box, my mirror. I had it on my phone. And I had to really put it in my heart and believe that I'm a new creation and I'm not a drug addict or an alcoholic and that I'm a son of God. And um, the last 10 years from 24 to, to 34 now has been really a journal. There are some people that have been knowing me for quite a few years, uh, like Lane and Daryl. Um, so it's just, like he said, that they have people that, that have been in my life over the years in different seasons that have been showing me how to pray, showing me how to read the Bible, showing me how to worship and how to pray for people. And literally, it's just all these people have helped me to create an atmosphere where God would just walk with me daily. And I turned my house into a worship. Like, I always have music in my house. If you can ask my wife. Like, I am just, we have to have worship music because he's just, he's just that good. Like, the grace of God is just so good. And, and for an unbeliever, somebody that hated God and that actually smoked scripture, that he showed me a love that I've never had before. And when I found out that the cross and what he did on the cross, it just, it changed and transformed my life. And that his spirit came and he filled me with everything that I needed. It was just amazing. So as I walked through uh, the last 10 years, it's just every season has been growing me up to this point. And I'm just very grateful that the best is yet to come because I believe that it, it is a process and this morning, I was really, I was like, man, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this because it's just, I was in here. I typed all this stuff right here. I didn't even look at it one time because it's, it's what's on my heart, you know, and that's what somebody told me this morning. So just share your heart because that's where your walk is. And just, I'm so thankful for y'all. I'm thankful for Jesus because he's with me everywhere. I created that, that atmosphere, wherever I'm at, he's with me, the gym the house, the church, everywhere. He's walking with me. He's walking in the spirit. And you do have to put the old person down because the enemy will 
use people in your family close to you that will remind you of your past and you don't have to believe that. You have to believe the Bible. You have to believe the, what he said no matter what. And it's, it's whenever I started believing and actually that changed everything. So I just thank you all for letting share. It's just, I'm very grateful for Pastor Lane and Alan and everybody that's just he helped me along the way and they know who they are. So thank you all. Thank you, Shane. Wow. Isn't the Lord good this morning? Today, I know it's the last Sunday, it's our family Sunday. We've already celebrated communion last week uh, during Easter. What a phenomenal Easter service we had here. But as we were wrapping up this month, we don't wrap up the story of the cross, right? And the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we move forward, my prayer as this church moves forward is God, could you just help us to keep it simple around here? Let us keep it about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and let our response to that gospel message be the book of Acts, where signs, miracles, and wonders happen, where repentance, baptisms, and the infilling of his spirits take place. Lord, let us not just be a social gathering on Sunday, but let us be an active, vibrant, anointed, power, spirit, feel body of believers that impacts our community, it impacts our city, it impacts our state. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? And as our worship team gets ready to lead us back into a worship, and uh, I know some of you are thinking, Pastor, is service already over? This is a lot earlier than what you get through preaching. That's okay. I'm thinking the same thing. I love it. I love it. But we're strengthened by what we hear from each other. We're strengthened. If you knew the story of the person standing beside you, if you knew the struggle that they've been through, I know we get all dressed up on Sunday and come to the house of God and we smile. And, hey, how you doing? Great. How's it going? Wonderful. You look nice. Thank you. How's your family? How's your grandkids? How's the job? Good. How about them saints? They going to get a quarterback? I don't know. And we're so good about talking around the issues that people are really dealing with. And I just want to open up this, this morning because I feel so much hope today. I feel so much joy today. I feel like after hearing the scriptures and hearing the stories that we've heard that people are thinking, you know what? God's got me. If God's got me, I can do this. Not on my own strength, but through him. And if I'm facing this, there's a good chance somebody else is facing this as well. And if God can do it for me, and if God can do it through me, then I know that God can do it for somebody else as well. Do you feel that way this morning? Amen. God is for you. He's not against you today. As the worship team begins to lead us in worship this morning, hey, I would just like to open up. The, we call this the altar area, this big open area in front of this platform this morning. And if you would like to come this morning, we do believe in anointing with oil and pray. We'll anoint with oil. We don't embarrass, but we'll partner with you. We'll agree together. And I believe that God can change the narrative in your life, that God can take the test and give you a testimony, that God can take the mess and give you a message, that your life can can become a platform for you to share your story as well and bring hope and encouragement. And I, can we just pray together right now? Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the hope that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, for the scriptures. Thank you, God, for the testimonies that we have heard in this house today. And Lord, right now, I come against those voices that even now are battling against people's minds, telling them that it's not far 
of them, telling them of the reason that God is angry at them or mad at them or telling them that their past is too big of a hurdle for God to crawl over and to get to them. I just want to bring those lies to the foot of the cross this morning and trample on them in the name of Jesus right now, God, that you are for us and that you are not against us. We call out the lies of the devil this morning. God, we shake the bonds of addictions today and we speak, be set free today by the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. And Lord, I speak identity today, God. And I speak purpose in this house this morning over the lives of people and over the lies that they have heard. God, I speak over trauma and I speak over the hurt of yesterday. Those things that have been hidden and tucked away. Those things that come to us in the middle of the night that try to continually pull us down. Lord, I speak victory through the blood of Jesus Christ over those things today. And Lord, I speak joy in the house of God. Lord, we're more than overcomers today. Lord, by by you and through you today. If somebody said in Jesus' name, come on, say it today in Jesus' name. Come on, declare it today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands and give the Lord praise this morning. Come on, I see the promises of God for you today. Don't give up now. I see the promises of God for you today. Don't stop now. I see the joy of the Lord is for you today. Don't give up now. Don't throw in the towel. Don't back up from where God is leading you to. But I see that God is for you today. Right now. In the name of Jesus.